Go. Okay, class, here we are in our second hall of the dinosaurs. This hall is actually dedicated to the Ornithischian dinosaurs, also known as the bird hip dinosaurs, even though they aren't actually the ancestors of birds. So it's this kind of random nomenclature that happened uh, historically, but we're now corrected. Anyway, the Ornithischians are known for having a uh, backward pointing extension of their pubis bone, which identifies them as a single monophyletic clade that we see here, which includes uh, the Stegosaurus, uh, Triceratops, those are the buns, the horned uh, dinosaurs, as well as the uh, large clay uh, duck pill dinosaurs, known as the Hadrosaurus. Over here, you'll see we have a large Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus was an armor plated uh, herbivore with long spikes on its tail that it used to defend itself. One of the unique things about what happens when you're in a museum. One of the unique things about the Ornithischian group is they um, are all herbivores. And within those herbivores, we, are, they, we, can, we call them what are known as genosaurs. And genosaur relates to the fact that one of the, uh, one of the synapomorphic traits of this group is that the teeth are actually inset um, from the actual cheek. So they're actually internalized on the jaw. And these teeth are very mo uh, are modified for actually eating very tough, fibrous plant matter. If we move over here, we can see that those teeth actually have some very unique characters themselves. Unlike some of the primitive characters that we see um, uh, in um, uh, the sauropods that we saw uh, among the Sauritians, which have just single teeth with some cusps, like we see here, that were used for cutting into plant matter. The Ornithischians evolved a very unique set of teeth that have uneven uh, enamel coverings. So on the outside of the tooth, there was actually very thick enamel, and on the inside was actually softer. And this white part is actually dentine, which is a hard uh, but not necessarily very um, uh, brittle surface. And this arrangement allowed those two teeth to shear against each other. So they, when the two jaws closed, they were able to shear against each other. And as they filed down the enamel, it allowed them to break through much harder um, or tougher plant matter. Very so here we are in class among the hadrosaurs, also known as the duck-billed dinosaurs. You can see they got to tremendous sizes. One of the unique things about the hadrosaurs was that they had these very enlarged nasal crests. These nasal crests had incredibly different types of morphology. You see a lot of diversity. Here's a big arcing crest. Here's a big looping one that comes over the back of the head. Um, so you saw much, a lot of interesting morphological diversity in that expanded nasal cavity. Now what that was used for, we don't really know. We can guesstimate. Uh, some hypotheses suggest that that enlarged nasal cavity was used as a resonating chamber to, for low-frequency uh, communication uh, among animals in the group, much like maybe elephants would. Others suggested that it was used for, to allow them to, say, submerge in ponds and lakes because they were known to be semi-aquatic, or at least we think they are, because of their web footing, to allow them to stay underwater longer to feed on aquatic vegetation. Still others suggest that those were actually signaling or communicating um, uh, artifacts among uh, species like male-male competition. Uh, but we don't really know because we can't go back in time and actually measure their behavior. But those are some interesting hypotheses. So among ornithischians, we have two really cool groups of dinosaurs. The hadrosaurs that we talked about just a minute ago, those duck-billed dinosaurs. And of course, some of my favorites, the ceratopsians, which are those big horned uh, dinosaurs. Now, both of these dinosaurs were unique in that they had these tooth batteries where they had thousands and thousands of teeth that actually were able to cut through very tough plant material. Interestingly, though, they developed different mechanisms for chewing on that tough plant material. The hadrosaurs actually used a grinding type of surface where what we see in the ceratopsians is actually more of a slicing, cutting type of surface. But they both had these huge batteries of teeth that allowed them to eat really tough plant material. Fascinating stuff. So here we are with the ceratopsians, some of my favorite, the horned dinosaurs. And what you'll see is a huge diversity of morphologies, where the placements of the horns are either on the nose or higher up on the skulls above the eyes, and they had these huge frills or back armored plates behind their heads. What those were used for uh, are, there have been a number of hypotheses, but what we first see is a lot of different interesting morphological diversity in the placement and size of the horns.
You can see from these two specimens of ceratopsians that they had these huge head shields or frills. What these were actually used for was probably allowed to uh, help them in defense against predators, probably help in actually defense against predators and protecting that sensitive neck region. But it also created a large surface area for the attachment of muscles that went down to the jaws that allowed them to feed on that really tough plant matter. So here we have Triceratops, one of the most famous ceratopsians. They had a huge horns and that huge frill or uh, armored plate that protected the neck. Those horns probably protected and allowed it to defend itself against big predators like Tyrannosaurus rex. Those horns were probably also used in combat with other males for mates. Uh, it was also probably a display mechanism to attract mates. So you can see there was a multiple possible functions for these horns in that big head shield.